Hello everybody, and thank you all for attending today. I'm excited to present to you some work I've been doing on exploring match molecular pairs, and in particular the concept of activity cliffs, using some chemaxon tools uh, integrated with graph databases. To set the stage, I'd like to note that this is primarily an expository piece of work, uh, trying to identify different ways of interrogating and exploring the data that can be achieved using these tools. But if you're looking for scale-up numbers and benchmarks for speed, those will sadly not be present in this presentation. I usually like to begin my presentations with acknowledgements rather than simply squeezing them at the end. So here we are. Before working on the analysis of the match molecular pairs, they have to first be generated. And this was achieved uh, using Chemaxon's JChem extensions in the Nine workflow tool. We then moved on to representing and interrogating the networks in Neo4j, which you'll learn plenty more about. And this was the primary interface uh, used for interacting with the graph networks. That includes the use of its built-in visualization tool, which is called Bloom. We also used Cytoscape, which is an open source visualization platform designed for exactly such networks. This was used along with extension applications named ChemViz2 and Cypher queries in order to generate visualizations with chemical structures depicted on them. Uh, the two primary papers that guided a lot of this work are also shown here on this page, and you'll see references to them later in the, in the presentation. And finally, all the data that was studied um, and will be presented here was downloaded from the public Kemble database. Uh, we queried it a little to look at structures that um, have activities of JNK1 and JNK2 associated with them, and then filtered down to, to get to the PIC50 values. So to properly speak about activity cliffs, and in particular in, in the context of match molecular pair analysis, I'd first like to do a basic introduction on the concept of MMPA. This is a fairly widespread technique that's used to investigate structure activity relationships, or SARs. Conceptually speaking, MMPA is, is pretty straightforward. It's a substructure-based comparison of similar small molecule structures where the two compounds are related by a single chemical transformation. And these two compounds form what's called a match molecular pair. And in any given data set, we would expect activity values to be provided for each member of the pair. From here, we assign the difference in activities, shown here by the delta activity, to be due to the chemical transformation that we've chosen. And if we expand this methodology across larger and larger data sets, we can get a good feel for what sort of transformations may lead to appreciable or negligible deltas. And this has become a pretty strong component of the QSAR toolbox. When we're interpreting such a resulting activity landscape, an important feature to pay attention to is large activity jumps that are associated with a single transformation. And such jumps are often termed activity cliffs, and their features of pretty great interest. Here we see some activity cliffs uh, that are represented in the context of an activity landscape diagram. Now this is a pretty common visualization of, of large-scale SAR where the chemical space itself is occupying the first two dimensions, while our activity, or in some cases delta activity, um, is sitting on our, on our vertical axis. And these activity cliffs sometimes cause controversy. On the one hand, it's, it's quite exciting that such a small chemical modification could elicit a huge jump in activity. But on the other hand, such a discontinuity in the landscape makes SAR modeling difficult and can even often be considered an outlier in the data set. Whatever your opinion, it's quite easy to see that the activity cliff, or at least the surrounding landscape, uh, merits some further investigation. One of the choices we face when starting an MMP study is that of which, which methodology should be used to generate the pairs. Um, without going too into detail on all the different algorithms that can be used. I'll just say that in this application study, uh, we chose the widely known algorithm published about a decade ago by Hussein and Rayo. Uh, 
And in this algorithm, the compounds are fragmented across every acyclic bond, which generates key value pairs, uh, wherein the core of the structure forms the key, and the cleaved substructure provides the value. After we iterate through the whole data set, any indices that share a key uh, represent a match molecular pair, and we can generate a smart, a smart string to capture the transformation from one structure to another. There's a few additional nuances, double and triple cuts, and limiting size of fragments that I won't dive into too many details in here. The, some of the key advantages of this algorithm, though, is that it offers the ability to be executed on a reasonable size data, sh data set on most common machines, um, as well as the fact that there's no need for us to manually go and predefine functional groups uh, to be cleaved. Now, a short introduction on graph databases themselves. So these use the graph structure model to represent values and relationships between the different data points. So nodes of various types are linked by these relationships. Um, and these in turn also have a type. And these types of both the nodes and the relationships, as well as additional properties that you can assign, tell us something about how everything is interrelated. We have a simple example that's shown here. This is actually the uh, the default demo graph from Neo4j, where we have blue nodes that represent movies and orange nodes representing people. Um, and you'll notice that these people have relationships uh, pointing to the movies, and that relationship also has a type. And in this case, the types are something like acted in or directed. Um, so you can you have to look at the path that goes from the person to the relationship. Uh, to learn a little bit more about about what the nature of that interaction is. Graph databases are often somewhat limited relative to traditional relational database systems when it comes to certain aspects of scaling, but they are really excellent for exploring data that's highly related. So that's why we chose to, to look at these in a graph database. Um, and one of the most common current graph database providers is Neo4j, who offer both free community offerings as well as um, enterprise level offerings. Our JChem tools have long been used to provide chemical backbones to generic database systems, um, as well as providing chemical manipulation and calculation. One of the key features we usually bring is chemical searching. So as part of the constant innovation and new projects undertaken at Comaxon, we developed a proof of concept search cartridge that interfaces with the Neo4j and provides you exactly that searchability. Similarity, substructure, and duplicate searches can all be achieved. Uh, and this is done by calling custom defined procedures in Neo4j's native cipher queries. There's a hit count limit that's included, uh, and you can even add specific triggers to enable automatic chemical indexing. This technology has previously been implemented at Sanofi to generate a chemical similarity graph tool. Uh, there's a, a nice video presentation of this from one of our prior UGMs, which is available on our YouTube page. Uh, such visualizations are often termed network-like similarity graphs, or NSGs. The highly relational nature of match molecular pairs makes them a great fit for representation in a graph database. And the design of the underlying data model is of importance here, so I'd like to discuss it briefly. We decided to represent each of the full original structures without any sort of uh, breaking or cleaving as, as nodes in Neo4j. The properties include a string representing the chemical structure, a chemical ID integer value, and a float that describes a particular activity. Transformations were then added as relationships. We use the smart strings uh, to map from one compound to another. And another important property is the delta activity, which is stored as a property of the relationship. We decided to create two one-way relationships to represent the transformation uh, to enable the exploration in both the positive and negative direction. I'd like to also mention here that we should keep in mind one of the advantages of the graph database is we don't need to fully flesh out our data model at the beginning. Um, the, the foundations should be there but it is also very easy to add ad hoc properties and relationships of entirely new types, either on an individual or, or database-wide scale. Uh, 
So when we find that a new property or feature becomes relevant, uh, we can add that and we can restrict that only to, to places where it is relevant. Uh, for example, whether um, we could add a relationship between two nodes that indicate that one is the substructure of the other um, or that they have a high similarity value, as in NSGs. So after creating this database, the first thing we set out to look at is, you know, can we find some activity cliffs? And we can find these fairly in a fairly straightforward manner simply by assessing the relationship's activity values. Uh, the cliff in this case was chosen rather arbitrarily. Uh, first, we calculated the mean and the standard deviation of all the delta activities, and then just entered a query that returns the first 10 relationships um, that possessed an absolute delta activity outside of that one standard deviation range. So anything that was more than one standard deviation above the mean. We chose to look at the smaller cluster first, and the first thing we went ahead and did is, is expanded the cluster that was provided, um, provided by the query. And we see that by doing this, we find an additional node that forms MMPs with, with each of the two already detected nodes. The delta activity here also turns out to be quite high, but just slightly below our cutoff. So this provides an excellent example of where using the features of a graph database to expand and interrogate a little more uh, fluidly allows us to explore the space around the cliffs and overcomes some of the inherent limitations of just setting a hard cutoff. We then went ahead and looked at the larger cluster from the previous slide and, and ran a similarity-based search on the database. And what we see is that it's it's roughly doubled the size of that cluster. And looking at the relationships that are generated, um, most of them were, again, fairly close to our cliff cutoff. So again, expounding on that exploration of, of the graph database. You might also notice that in this cluster, there's a high similarity between all the cores. So there's a reasonable push towards running a substructure search on the rest of the database uh, using simply that core to see what other kind of what kind of hits we have, whether they are uh, substructure based or whether it's something particular to this to this subset of those molecules. It also provides a nice easy way to look at um, activity cliffs in more of a contextual value. Um, a certain transformation may provide um, large jumps only when being executed upon, say, a certain uh, substructure or, or scaffold. You can also see that there's a lot of relationships here, which may be overwhelming at first, but um, in a production setting, this could easily be overcome by appropriate visualization tools and settings. And in fact, I see this as a demonstration of the relationship of our data, um, which justifies the use of graph databases further, as far as I'm concerned. Now, once we've identified an MMP that leads to activity cliff-like behavior, it's time to explore a little bit around the cliff. And one way to achieve this could be as follows. Let's say we've identified a transformation that leads to the formation of a cliff. We've done a little similarity searching, or perhaps expanded on the nodes, and we notice that the other compounds affected the most by the transformation are all structurally similar. How can we generalize this to interrogate all the similar structures? Now the answer is a simple, simple combination of similarity searching the nodes and then filtering on the relationships. So by first returning all the structures in the database that are similar to our principal structure of interest, and then filtering out on the rela sorry, relationships to only match those identical to that matching our MMP, we're able to easily view this data across the entire database. So that provides us a great way to do more context-based searching. And from here, we can go ahead and see how widespread the cliff-causing behavior is. In this case, we found that although one demethylation of the structure on the right leads to significant delta activity, analysis of similar MMPs in the way I've just described shows very few similar phenomena. In fact, the next closest delta activity is less than a third of that of our initial MMP. We can also expand the scope of our search if we identify an interesting scaffold. So in the example we see here, we run a substructure search on the structure on the left before again filtering on relationships. In this case, we do see a small expansion in the relevant structures, 
However, none of the new relationships showed particularly interesting delta activity values. The idea of an activity pair is somewhat more recent of a development. At its core, it looks at the difficulty in assigning activity changes to an individual change in the structure. If we take this example here, we see a prime example of a synergistic effect in changes at the two sites. Um, if we see that the delta PKI is, is far greater for when both, uh, both substructures are changed than when an individual one is. However, with the traditional algorithms used to generate MMPs, uh, this could lead to a significant limitation in, say, skewing the change of the, the four-member ring structure we see in the bottom left to the three-member ring in the top right. Uh, does that change by itself really elicit a delta activity of 1.7? Probably not. So one of the great uh, advantages here is that we can use um, our visual interpretation of the graphs and graph algorithms to further um, look at um, such data and such changes. Our limited data set didn't reveal such uh, an example very concretely, but it did expose a few spots where maybe we have some information that's lacking and needs to be filled into our knowledge base. If we take a look here, we see a rather significant change of 1.2, and that's related to both um, a positional change as well as a change in the subgroup um, of, of the top moiety of the um, of the structure. But we don't have a full set of information uh, to see if this is a synergistic effect or not. So this is a great way to identify where the gaps in our knowledge base are. In such situations, if we can identify the common substructure, uh, we could run stru structural searches um, to look across the database to see if there's any additional information that can be revealed. At a certain point, we would want to expand our search from similar structures and cores to the investigation of similar transformations. So while a reaction similarity search has not yet been implemented in our cartridge, a good workaround is enabled by our choice of the data model here. So in this case, I've set up a separate graph database using what's called the line graph of the original database. For those not familiar with the term, um, a line graph is essentially the inverse of the graph that we start with. Every relationship becomes a node, and the adjacency of the old relationships is shown by new relationships, which share properties with the old nodes. So a simple example is shown at the top here. We did this in our data set by creating simply nodes that represent the chemical transformations. If we find that a simple transformation in our original data set is interesting, we can run a substructure search on this line graph as the query uh, to find other similar queries of interest. We show here a simple example of such a query. The information located here can easily be used to cross-reference with the original graph. We see there is a little shortage of results. In fact, the main limitation is that sometimes running a substructure search may yield to many varied results. I'd like to wrap up now um, and just look at a few takeaways or, or future ideas that I have. Uh, first of all, when running a typical MMDB, you often have to run a lot of searching first and create your graph based upon this, the results. The nice thing about this model is we can create a much more general MMP analysis um, without worrying about everything in the first place and then use the more visual interrogation of a graph model um, in order to overcome that hurdle. It's very simple to explore the relatedness of the chemical entities. Um, we could even envision adding multiple activities or activity changes in one relationship, or simply adding more relationships. As we mentioned before, the addition is arbitrary. Also, there's the idea of following a path of additive relationships. You know, do two changes in a row exhibit an additive property change? You know, how do we look at the activity pair issues that we looked before, etc. Um, and that's where some of the power of graph exploration really comes in. Um, there's a huge diversity and um, different problems that have been set for graph exploration and a huge variety of already developed algorithms out there, which are great for further looking at um, problems, as long as you define your relationships and your properties well to match the algorithm. Uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you for, again for your attention, and I'd like to take any questions.